Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Bangsa Modern Debates. They protested against the supposed railroading of the proposed anti-terror law of 2020, which now only needs the signature of President Rodrigo Duterte. You have heard the critical issues argued on both sides on the constitutionality of the anti-terrorism bill. The Philippine government is at the verge of adopting the new anti-terrorism law. The essential feature of this anti-terrorism bill that was passed by our bicameral Congress this anti-terrorism bill seeks to enhance and uh, strengthen the state's policy against terrorism. It aims to recalibrate the approach of the Philippines against terrorism by amending or even repealing the existing HSA or the Human Security Act of 2007. This is an initiative that is not strictly uh, bound by the textual rules of a formal debate and so we do not strictly adhere to the rules of a formal debate. Welcome to the Pants of Debates! Oregon Oxford debate format. The debate is between the affirmative and the negative house with three members each. Each debater from the affirmative house argues on the necessity, beneficiality, and practicability of the proposition. The counterpart debater are opposes these arguments. Each debater is given three minutes to deliver its consumptive speech and one minute to interpolate or cross-examine the counterpart debater. From the affirmative side, we have Fahad. Fahad, you have three minutes to tell us why is it necessary that the bill is unconstitutional. Your three minutes starts now. Terrorism has been a very familiar problem our country is facing in every administration, including the current ones. The names changes, but their actions do not. As much as we would like to eradicate it, we must do it legally. It is an elementary rule in lawmaking bodies how imperative it is to stay within the Constitution in making legislations. Ladies and gentlemen, on the issue of the unconstitutionality of the anti-terrorism bill, we affirm such. The anti-terrorism bill is unconstitutional. Laws must define the crimes that they seek punishment for, as clearly as possible. Ambiguity and inexactness of the definition of terrorism in the bill negate such, it can be used to achieve certain ends that do not necessarily protect people's welfare nor maintain the integrity of the Constitution. In the case of Romaldes versus Comelec, the void for vagueness doctrine was applied. The doctrine holds that, that a law is facially invalid if men of common knowledge must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application. That is not such a law. The former Justice Carter himself, an interpreter of the law, has expressed his concern on the vagueness of the definition of terrorism, specifically in Section 4 of the said bill. The Anti-Terror Bill also attacks our right to dissent. The bill provides a leeway to target criticism and dissent instead of actually solving the problem of terrorism by having provisions that makes the line between activism and terrorism uncontrollably thin. This bill results in the chilling effect in which the people would rather not dissent in fear of being branded as a terrorist. In the case of Disney versus Secretary of Justice, the Supreme Court ruled that when a law is encroaches upon the freedom of speech and expression of a person, a facial challenge on the ground of void for vagueness rule is allowed. On its susceptibility to abuse and the reliance of judgment calls made by the ATC, law enforcement agent or, or military personnel can simply claim good faith on their duties. We always hear them say, I am not a terrorist. Why should, why should I be afraid of the bill? Well, if this bill becomes a law, it will make you one, even if you're not. That would be all. Thank you. Do you recognize the necessity of striking a balance between national security interests and the fundamental rights? Definitely. 
very well. So are you with me that the anti-terrorism bill is contrary to the Bill of Rights? No, I think not. So you are discrediting the Section 2 of the said bill in accordance with the Bill of Rights, specifically freedom of speech and civil liberty. But then again, there are provisions no, that contradict the My third question, Council, please respect my time. Citizens. I have my next question, Council. Okay. So, Council, are you with me that the prime duty of the government is to serve and protect the people? Definitely, yes. Yes, thank you for your concession and look for your questions. Two points of rebuttal. In Viraga versus Philippine Truth Commission, the vagueness was not considered a valid reason to strike down the law. Second point. It was declared in Chavez versus Gomez that the freedom of speech and the freedom of expression was not absolute. It will yield to the national security. Now, as the first speaker of this house, allow me to establish the constitutionality and the necessity of that anti-terrorism bill. First, Section 4, Article 2 of the Constitution states that the prime duty of the government is to serve and protect the people. Clearly, the right to protection is a constitutional mandate. It has been three years since the tragic Marawi siege. Until now, however, terrorist attacks continue to permeate the country, making it hard for the government to ensure safety among its citizens from those who persistently seek to destroy our motherland. This is the situation in the Philippines. Second, presumption of constitutionality. Unless otherwise declared by the Supreme Court, this bill enjoys the presumption of constitutionality. Even if some provisions may be declared to be unconstitutional, the entire bill does not succumb to be unconstitutional as such is protected under the separability clause provided in Section 55 of this bill. If in Wong vs. Ochoa, some provisions of the RHB were unconstitutional, but the entire bill itself is constitutional. Third, the anti-terrorism bill is the improved version of the Human Security Act of 2007. This act has proved to fail in terms of its efficacy as the anti-terrorism measure, probably because it's lenient to offenders and restrictive to enforcers. The DOJ Task Force on Anti-Terrorism secures only three convictions on terrorists for more than a decade. Fourth, the popular majority in the Philippines is not unaware of the dangers of terrorism. They are even taking advantage of the COVID-19 outbreak. Even the lockdown did not stop terrorism. According to Harry Roque, 6,000 residents of Maguindano have abandoned their home because of terrorist attacks, while 11 soldiers were killed in the Sulu attack. Now, more than ever, it becomes imperative for the government to effectively respond not only to the threats of terrorism, but also not only to the challenges posed by COVID-19, but also to the threats of terrorism. Are you familiar with the Rule 1 markets or Section 5 of the Rules of Court pertaining to warrantless arrests? Yes. Under Rule 113, Section 5, any law enforcement agent can effect a warrantless arrest only for urgent cases where the crime is happening almost at the moment of an arrest. Yes. Correct? Okay. According to the authors of the bill, warrantless arrest under Section 29 of the anti terror Bill is pursuant to Rule 113. Correct? Okay, so if that's the case, Section 29 of the Anti-Terror Bill would be senseless because warrantless arrests are allowed only if it has been duly authorized no, yes, by mistaken. the ATC in writing. Section Not this answer yes or no, this is no, no time because I have another no, question. No, but please, allow me to answer. You cannot arrest upon a person duly authorized by the ATC in writing. Yes, Section 29 of the Anti-Terror Bill would be senseless. You cannot arrest upon a person during urgent situations if you still need to secure the written authorization no, no. of the ATC. I guess you are Can mistaken. You? I guess you are mistaken. No, ma'am. The role of the ATC is only a written authorization and not a word of arrest. It's the first stat of the affirmative pledge that the anti-terror bill is unconstitutional unless its big provisions are non-beneficial. Contrary to the first negative speaker's argument, certain overbreadth and ambiguous provisions of the ATB creates more opportunities for misinterpretations, maltreatment, and even extrajudicial enforcement of authority. A very valid reason to strike the law. Section 10 of the bill penalizes the recruitment and membership in a terrorist organization. We argue that this type of the very essence of democracy and rights guaranteed by the Constitution. TPM versus Philippine Blooming Mills provides that the rights of free expression, free assembly, and petition are also political rights essential to man's life. Unlawful privacy invasion. Okre versus Torres states that the governmental powers stop short of certain intrusions to the personal life of a citizen. 
Under ATB, if a person merely suspected of committing acts in violation of such can be served upon giving wide discretion in favor of law enforcement. Lawless warrantless arrest, Section 3 of the ATB demolishes the inviolable right against unreasonable searches and seizures. In People v. Marty, the constitutional prescription against this right applies as a restraint directed against the government and its agencies tasked with the enforcement of the law. In contrast, Your Honors, the bill allows law enforcers to search and record communications of suspected persons without the presence of a warrant. Section 17 of the bill grants judicial authorization upon probable cause to believe that the evidence will be obtained later on and not for the evidence available during such determinations. Your Honors, our law requires that before issuing a warrant, the existence of probable cause should be determined by the judge. This entirely places the subject into the arbitrary detention or determination of an offense and gravely violates his right to due process. Section 25 of the ATB allows the Anti-Terrorism Council to designate any person as a terrorist and allows the Anti-Money Laundering Council to freeze the assets of this designated as such without even giving the agreed party an opportunity to submit a countervailing evidence to prove his side. Your Honors, this also this bill also amounts to a bill of attainder for it inflicts punishment without a trial. Section 29 allows ATC, an executive body, an authority to determine for itself if there are sufficient grounds for prolonging a person's deprivation of liberty. Only a judge can issue a warrant of arrest. Angara versus the Electoral Commission was clear that the principle of separation of powers is a fundamental principle in our government. It further demolishes the warrant of arrest upon probable cause. From the principal author's own words, you can be arrested if you still did not commit the crime on the justification that the authorities would want to be proactive. Your Honors, we find that the seeming benefits of the anti-terror bill do not offset the necessity of its enactment. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Are you with me that terrorism is a threat to national security? Yes, of course. Thank you for your concession. Now, is protection of the individual a constitutional mandate of the government? Yes, Your Point, Council, please. Are you aware of Section 2, Article 4 of the Constitution? Yes, of course. Okay. Are you aware of the United Nations Security Commission Resolution 1374? Yes, Council, your point. It states that the government has both their duty and their right to enact counter legislative measures that will protect yes, the national Yes, Those are the my time. I will take right, the last question. question. Given the last question, Council? Yes. Does the Philippines have the authority to enact laws for the protection of teachers? Of course, but then, yes, yeah, thank, thank you for your attention. And that is the anti terror bill. No more further questions. Thank you. Dangers and threats of terrorism in the Philippines are both legitimate and real. Ladies and gentlemen, in line tonight is the constitutionality of a bill. A bill that can potentially eradicate and suppress terrorist attacks that continues to permeate the country, making it hard for the government to secure its citizens. Two points of our buckles. First, activism is not terrorism. As enshrined in Section 4 of the Anti-Terror Bill, advocacy, decent, protest, and other similar exercises of civil and political rights are not terrorism. In second, in Section 29 thereof, the determination of the extension of the detention still remains with the courts. Your Honors, this House recognizes the beneficiality of the Anti-Terror Bill. We firmly believe that now more than ever, the Philippines is in need of an iron hand that could stop and eradicate terrorist attacks to save our citizenry and the identity of the Bangsamoro from the devastating effects of terrorism. First point, security of the nation is of utmost importance. In the 2019 Global Terrorism Index, the Philippines is the only Southeast Asian country which ranked in the top 10 most impacted by terrorism. This includes the destruction of life, liberty, and property. In the Bangsamoro region, this land suffered and continues to suffer from the terrors of this terrorism. From 2000 to 2012, there were more than 25 grenade attacks that this region suffered. This leads me to my second point, the identity and development of the Bangsamoro and the Philippines had greatly been affected by this act. In 2010, the Philippines have been dubbed as haven for terrorists, the military. 
publicly revealed that there were around 50 foreign national terrorists operating in Mindanao. With the advent of the anti-terror bill, this will provide a comprehensive approach together with the peace process in addressing the root cause of terrorism. The Philippines will send them a message that the government is in the fight against terrorism. Are you aware of Article 3, Section 1 of our Constitution? Yes. Isn't it that under Section 25 of the Anti-Terror Bill, the ATC has the power to designate individuals Nowhere in the terrorism. bill. Please respect the... my final yes, answer. Yes, yes or no. Please. It is sufficient to rely on the personal knowledge of the authority to find probable cause and subsequently the authority to raise the suspected order of the court. It is still within the definition of the court. Yes or no, counsel. No. No. It is still within yes the no, definition of the court. Then would you agree with me that the due process means a hearing where an individual can present his side to rebut the allegations against him? Yes. 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 And under Section 25 of the bill, ATC can tag anyone as a terrorist without being given the chance to be made clearly a violation of the right against the violation of the right without due process. No further questions, Your Honor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before us is a proposition that whether or not the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 is unconstitutional. We on the affirmative side strongly believe that it is not it is not only unconstitutional, but also a law of terror. This bill is not only unnecessary and non-beneficial as previously presented, but also impractical. Why? First, the withdrawal of support from the lawmakers. It questions the honesty and quality of the lawmaking process. As of June 9, some of them have already withdrawn their vote, stating that they did not have enough time to study the content of the bill before the vote, not to mention all amendments to the bill were all rejected. Second, the absence of proper stakeholder consultation. There is no mention of LGU or CSO participation or any consultations in making high-level decisions. Proper consultations with stakeholders must have been made to give a more comprehensive picture of the possible actions that should be taken. Lastly, anti-terror bill removes Section 41 of the Human Security Act of 2007, which gives safeguards to suspects who are adjudged to be acquitted for the crime. Safeguards must be deliberately set in place to avoid grave abuse of discretion. This is true in number of cases here in Bar, where incidences of mistaken identity and tagging of our Islamic schools as training grounds for terrorists still continue to exist. In our present law system, if the judge believes that you have not committed any crime, he cannot issue a warrant of arrest. But with Anti-Terrorism Act, to quote Senator Lapson's words, hindi pa nangyari, nasa simula pa lamang, pwede na nating arrestuhin. This is a dreadful law not only for the actual terrorists, but for everyone. Why? Anyone can be arrested out of mere suspicions only. Anyone can be designated right away as a terrorist without being required hearings to defend himself. Or maybe you will be house arrested even if you are entitled to bail. Or imagine being detained for as long as 24 days even without being charged of any crime. Even the rate of habeas corpus would not be much of help in this situation. The courts may require the custodian to justify the detention, but all the custodian needs to do is show the written authority of the ATC to the judge, then the judge will be compelled to dismiss the petition. Assuming that authorities cannot gather enough evidence, Within 24 days of detention, there is no provision in the bill regarding re-arrest. After a few days, he can be arrested again, and the 24-day day cycle will keep on repeating. We hope none of the Filipinos will be a victim of repression or worse, life imprisonment just because they have been wrongfully tagged as terrorists. To our Bangsamora brothers and sisters, we have always been a, a subject of generalization and misjudgment. Imagine living in a country where every step we take scares us, knowing that we are being monitored by a state agent who is lawfully authorized by the state, when our only crime is being a Muslim. Again, we have given you different arguments. All are aimed at the same point. Anti-terrorism act is unconstitutional. No matter what the opposing bench said, they cannot seem to prove their points nor debunk ours. It is with this that we politely and confidently rest our case. Thank you very much. Council, are you aware of how legislation is passed? Yes. Thank you. Now, moving on, are you aware that there should be grounds for the power of legislation, especially here in the anti terror bill? Of course. Exactly. Now, okay, the question is, are you aware of these step tests and standards? Yes. Oh, very well. Ladies and gentlemen, in Inchon Professor Hernandez, the test and standard for legislation must be firmly grounded on public interest and public welfare. It is nowhere found in the Constitution that fear of abuse will be will declare or be unconstitutional. That is the point, Mr. Speaker. Now, is it in your position that terrorism is not a public interest? Is it in your position that terrorism is not a public interest? It is a public interest. Terrorism is a global predicament, and no nation is invulnerable to it. Good evening and assalamu alaikum. Allow me to rebut two points. First, 
the fear of abuse of the affirmative is wanting in this case because the fear of abuse is not a requisite of legislation. Second, in Section 45 of the Anti-Terror Bill, it is unequivocal because the fear of the affirmative does not hold water. The Anti-Terror Council shall not be empowered to have a quasi-judicial or ju judicial power or even the power of being an executioner. As the last speaker of this Bank Tomorrow debate, allow me to argue on the practicability of the Anti-Terror Bill. First point, the bill was drafted in conformance with Section 4, Article 2 of the Constitution that states the prime duty of the government is to serve and protect the people. As seen in Section 2 of the Senate Bill 1080 or the Anti-Terror Bill, it is directed to create measures in conflict management, post-conflict peace building, and develop equitable economic development. Ladies and gentlemen, the letter and intent of the law is simply but global. The Philippines will be exercising its constitutional right to implement necessary actions, which is also in keeping with the United Nations Security Commission Resolution 1373 and 1624 that directs countries to adopt necessary measures against terrorism in accordance with their legal obligation and their international law. Thus, the birth of ASEAN Convention on Counterterrorism of 2007, ladies and gentlemen, Philippines is a signatory. In Article 6 of the said convention, it laid down the acts and areas of cooperation in which the Anti-Terror Bill also resonates. First, to take necessary steps to prevent the commission of terror acts. Second, to prevent those who finance, plan, facilitate, or commit terrorist acts, which leads me to my last point. Terrorism knows no religion. It knows no race. It should be faced head-on with a strong legal structure and that is the proposition of this bill. The Bank Samoro is facing a new breed of mutating terrorists, which the anti-terror bill aims to eradicate. It has been to the submission of the affirmative house that the Bank Samoro people will be mostly affected. That this will help in establishing our Bank Samoro identity. If the affirmative house have scrutinized the bill, in Section 45 of the Anti-Terror Bill, the Chief Minister of Barb and NCMF, among others, shall serve as support agencies of the very Council. This will help unveil those who are falsely using the banner of Bang Samoro. This will help in exposing those who are wolves in sheep's clothing. But again, ladies and gentlemen, with a promise of fairness and always due process. Do you agree with me that our constitution, being the highest of the land, shall be inviolable for any purpose and all Of course, time? of course. Good. Isn't it under Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, no warrant of arrest shall be issued except upon probable cause? Yes, shall be yes, it's, probable it's just a yes or no. Yes, it's a probable yes. cause. Yes. Isn't it under, ma'am, third question. Isn't it under Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Bill, it was explicitly stated that any law enforcement agent can legally take custody of a person suspected of terrorism, yes, provided that they have been fully authorized in making Yes or no? Yes, it is within the Isn't it allowed to come? Isn't allowing the ATC, who is not part of the judiciary, to issue an authorization to respect my time? A clear violation of what the Constitution is only allowed. No, no, no. The Constitution is only part of the judiciary. No, the ATC is not part of the judiciary. various arguments on both sides, although we would like to remind you that the kind volunteers that we had from the, who are students of law, had volunteered to be debaters. So the arguments that they had presented and the examples that they had given in no way represents their personal convictions or their side. They had presented it as students of debate to present the various sides of an issue that is dividing the nation. We hope that uh, this will inspire more of the youth and the students to continue the practice of debate so that we will have more volunteers for the next episodes of the Bangsamoro debates. Till next time.